Mr. Speaker. On a cold night in January, the most watched moment on the American political calendar will unfold in Washington. The President of the United States. When the State of the Union address happens inside this building, it will be a must-see moment on TV and online, drawing the kind of ratings that rival the NFL playoffs. 45.6 million Americans tuned in to see President Trump in 2018. You can bet they were listening to every word closely. The state of our union is strong. Presidents don't just deliver the address for fun. Article 2, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution requires that they periodically give to the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. That's a fancy way of saying update the country on what's going on and explain what they plan to do in the future. You know what never gets old is when you stand there and then say, Mr. Speaker, that never gets old. It's kind of like the Super Bowl of politics, where every play is carefully choreographed. There's the motorcade ride from the White House to the Capitol. Better practice that speech on the seven-minute drive. And there's the President and First Lady's guest lists, carefully chosen to send a message. If you're in a seat, it's for a reason. Often, the speech is still being tweaked right up to the last minute. And the language is meant to make it memorable. Remember the axis of evil? States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. The audience isn't or isn't only members of Congress. Today, in many ways, the audience is the American people. And that's been uh, a development aided and embedded by the development of, of various technologies. From George Washington's first written address in 1790 to the first primetime TV address in 1965 by President Lyndon B. Johnson. Total agreement between the executive and the Congress is impossible. Total respect is important. The State of the Union address has morphed from a way to keep the public and Congress updated to a valuable political tool, even when things aren't good. The State of the Union is not good. Those in the room are part of this made-for-the-cameras political moment, playing a delicate game of to clap or not to clap. Typically, members of the president's own party will applaud almost everything he says, while members of the opposing party will sit on their hands. It gets really awkward when the Speaker of the House is from the opposing party, like Paul Ryan during the Obama years. All he could do was sit politely behind the president while the vice president clapped away. Supreme Court justices and members of the military have it even rougher. They can't applaud anything that seems like it's politically motivated. Awkward. Watch these military leaders decide whether or not they should clap at all. Okay, they went for it. It was very carefully choreographed, and the president wants to convey a particular image, and that image is bound up in his priorities. Um, in the same way, the opposing members uh, sit in a particular position, they make particular faces at certain times, they clap at their own particular moments. Uh, they are all communicating with the American people. Now, one of the quirks of the State of the Union is that it involves putting the president, vice president, cabinet, military leaders, Supreme Court justices, and all of Congress in the same room at the same time. And that's a security nightmare. Because if the unthinkable were to happen, say a terrorist attack or a disaster, well, there'd be no one left to run the government. During the Cold War, American officials were so worried about the threat of a surprise nuclear attack that they started naming a designated survivor who'd sit out the speech in a safe place. Secretary, you need to put the phone down. And no, we're not talking about Kiefer Sutherland. The White House selects a cabinet member to watch the address from a secret, secure location. It has to be someone who's eligible to be sworn in as president in a worst-case scenario. And ever since the September 11th attacks, a few members of Congress now sit out the speech too just in case they need to form an entirely new government. For all the pomp and circumstance, the speech can have real-world impacts. President Obama used his 2009 address to urge Congress to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the ban on gays and lesbians serving openly in the military. Congress went on to pass the repeal, and Obama signed it into law. Historically, just over 40% of legislative proposals uh, made in the State of the Union are enacted by the following Congress. 
A lot of that depends on when in the president's term it happens. Uh, more successful proposals are made early on, uh, and then throughout the president's term, uh, he tends to pivot away from domestic policy proposals, emphasizing foreign policy priorities. And it's certainly the case uh, that the intervention of politics makes a big difference. But experts have started to question just how relevant the State of the Union is, because in many ways it has come to reflect the deeply partisan divide in America and has moved away from its original intent. Those who support a president are likely to see what they want to see in the president, and those who oppose the president are likely to see exactly what they already see in a president. In other words, the speech is really good at improving perceptions of a president by making them look, well, presidential. But the content just isn't there. I call upon all of us to set aside our differences. As you saw with the clapping, just as a president seems to only be speaking to half the room, he may as well be speaking to only half of a very divided country. That's the real and unfortunate State of the Union, no matter what the president says in their speech.